Hi there, how you doing? Uh, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 109 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm Larry Erickson, I'm your host. And uh, why don't you just sit there for about the next half hour while I rant away at you at things that are important to me, I think deserve your attention. If you want to respond to the show in any way, you can contact me directly at whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can comment there, or you can get the uh, email address from there as well. Uh, I will tell you, however, if you want an answer to your email, please include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so that I know it's not spam. All right, with that introduction, uh, let's get to it. I, I'm going to start, as I always like to, whenever the opportunity arises, with some good news. Uh, Arizona had uh, passed a law barring abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, that is absent any kind of medical emergency. On May 21st, a panel of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals struck down the law, saying it violated a woman's constitutional right to terminate her pregnancy before the fetus uh, can survive outside the womb, which now is generally considered to be about 24 weeks. Uh, the state had tried to weasel out of this by saying, oh no, this wasn't a law, this was a medical regulation. The court didn't buy it. Uh, nine other states have adopted uh, restrictions on abortions after either 20 weeks or in some cases as little as 12 weeks, but uh, several of those bans have already been placed on hold or struck down by other courts. Okay, moving on to another bit of good news. Uh, Bill Clinton, the man who signed the Defense of Marriage Act and has since apparently come to regret it, is, let's say, trying to make up for lost time. He just urged the Illinois State House of Representatives to pass the same-sex marriage bill that was passed by the state Senate three months ago. The bill has been held up in the House by opposition from conservative groups and some black churches. But supporters uh, are now claiming that they have the votes in the House to get this passed before the May 31st deadline. Governor Pat Quinn supports the measure. So... Uh, if, in fact, uh, passing, uh, it actually pa passed through the House, that would mean that shortly thereafter that Illinois would become the 13th state to approve same-sex marriage. Meanwhile, on the international side, on May, 14, uh, May 18th, rather, French President Francois Hollande signed a law authorizing marriage and adoption by same-sex couples. France is the most populous country to have legal same-sex marriage. It's the 14th country worldwide, uh, and the first marriage is there could take place within days. All right, going to move on from there to uh, our regular weekly features. I got the Clown Award and the Outrage of the Week. And the thing is, both of these stories are from Florida, and I really couldn't decide which one should be which. But um, we're going to do it this way. Uh, this one we're going to label as the Clown Award. WTSB-TV in Tampa Bay, Florida, has uncovered a system, uh, systematic nationwide scam to shorten yellow lights at intersections for the specific purpose of collecting more money in traffic tickets for running red lights. Uh, in some areas, the money from such tickets has more than doubled. The station's investigating team discovered that back in 2011, the Florida State Department of Transportation quietly changed the state's policy on yellow intervals, reducing the minimum time for a yellow light to below federal recommendations. The rule change was followed by engineers, both from the state and from localities, collaborating to shorten the length of yellow lights at key intersections, particularly those with red light cameras. Red light cameras generated more than $100 million in revenue last year. Uh, they're using approximately 70 Florida communities. Over half of that money goes to the state. The rest goes to cities, counties, and the camera companies. In 2013, they are on pace to generate $120 million in revenue. Now, what makes this not only crummy and clownish, but also stupid, is that shortening yellow lights increases traffic fatalities. It increases, it makes traffic less safe. Uh, quoting from the U.S. Department of Transportation study, a one-second increase in yellow time results in a 40 percent decrease in severe red light related crashes, which also means then shortening yellow lights results in an increase in red light crashes. Uh, 
But apparently that doesn't matter as long as Florida Governor Voldemort gets his money. Clowns indeed. From there we go also back to Florida for our other regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. This is not late breaking news actually, but I just heard about it because the family just went public with this last week. Caitlin Hunt was an 18 year old high school senior at Sebastian River High School in Sebastian River, Florida. She was highly respected. She had good, good grades. She participated in cheerleading, basketball and chorus. She was even voted most school spirit. That is, until cops showed up on her, at her parents' door at, uh, on February 16th, handcuffed her, and arrested her on two felony counts of lewd and lascivious battery on a child. Her actual crime? She had a relationship with another girl, a 15-year-old teammate on the school girls' basketball team. They started dating last fall, and the younger girl's parents just couldn't handle it. So they are, it appears now, out to destroy Caitlin's life for the crime of turning their daughter gay. Caitlin's mother wrote in a statement that these other parents, quoting her, never came to us as parents, never tried to speak to us and tell us they had a problem with the girls dating. Instead, what they did, they had Caitlin arrested as an accused sex criminal. They tried to have her expelled from school. Now, despite the fact that the school administration refused to go along with this, despite the fact that there was a judge, judge's order that said Caitlin could stay in school provided the two girls had no contact, the parents went to the school board and successfully petitioned the school board to kick Caitlin out of school a couple of weeks before graduation. As of now, the state attorney's office is pressuring Caitlin to take a plea deal, which includes two years house arrest and a year of probation which not only would put her life on hold for a couple of years, this can, it would remain on her record as a conviction, which would greatly obviously limit her career choices. In other words, these, the other girl's parents may not succeed in destroying Caitlin's life, but they may succeed in severely damaging it. Those parents are bigots. The school board that expelled Caitlin is made up of buffoons. The state attorney's office is populated with twits, dolts, and jackasses, and the whole thing is an outrage. All right, from there to uh, other news. You have undoubtedly heard about, there's no question that you've heard about, the um, EF4 tornado in Oklahoma on May 20th, a massive storm that killed uh, at least two dozen people and destroyed a significant part of the town of Moore, Oklahoma, which is a suburb of Oklahoma City. There are two things about this that I wanted to talk about here. The first is that this tragedy, as such tragedies uh, often do, brought out the best in some among us. We've, we've all heard the tales of the, of the help, the assistance, the donations, uh, the surprise rescues, the, the grateful reunions between people and, and pets thought lost. But such events can also help to bring out or at least shine a light on some of the worst among us. And for, ex for an example of that, we need look no further than Oklahoma's joined at the hip right-wing bozo boy senators, James Inhofe and uh, Tom Coburn. These two have repeatedly tried to deny federal disaster relief to others. In 2011, they opposed legislation to grant necessary funding to FEMA, which manages uh, um, emergency relief. Coburn called funding FEMA unconscionable. Last year, they both opposed disaster relief for victims of Hurricane Sandy because it included Coburn claimed wasteful spending, such as a provision, quote, for future disaster mitigation activities and studies. That is, for studies looking for ways to make it less likely for such a thing to happen again. That to Coburn was a waste. Oh, but when it comes to Oklahoma, oh, no, when it comes to their interest, that's completely different. They have been more than willing to ask for and take whatever federal aid they can get. In January of 2007, Coburn demanded speedy relief uh, after Oklahoma hit a, had a major ice storm. In 2008, Inhofe got emergency relief from the Department of, Her uh, of Housing and Urban Development uh, after some severe weather affected Oklahoma. Just last month, Obama signed a disaster declaration for the state following severe snowstorms. 
Now, despite ranking 20th among states in area and 28th among states in population, Oklahoma ranks third behind just Texas and California in the number of federal disaster relief declarations. And now, Coburn and Inhofe, of course, they want federal help in the wake of the tornado. And the thing is, they want it paid for by offsets from, that is, cuts in other federal programs. So not only do they want the relief that they would deny to others, they want to pay for their relief by taking, funny, uh, taking monies away from other programs, monies that might have been used to benefit other people. Now, of course, of course, the people of Oklahoma should get the aid they need. Of course they should. That is not the issue here. The issue is the selfish parochialism that Coburn and Inhofe showed in asking for it. Now, this all brings up something else that I really wanted to talk about. We usually call something like this hypocrisy. But the question is, is this really hypocrisy or is it a psychological failing? In other words, are right-wingers just psychologically limited, the poor dears? I think I've mentioned in the past, I'm much too lazy to actually go back and find out, but I think I've mentioned in the past that something that I think of as a real difference between the left and the right, something actually that goes to the psychology of why you wind up being on the left or the right socially and politically, revolves around reification. Reification is the ability to see something abstract and to see it as concrete. As an example, an example to illustrate this idea uh, it was back during the health care debate when people talked about 50 million people without health insurance. Now, by the way, I am not going to get into the important difference between access to health insurance and the more important access to health care. Uh, something on which Obamacare still fails tens of millions of people. That's an argument for another time. Right now, I'm just using the number as an illustration. The thing is, for the right wing, that figure of 50 million was just that. It was a figure, a statistic, an abstraction. For people on the left, it's 50 million actual, honest-to-gosh people who are one serious illness away from, if they're lucky, bankruptcy, it's not just a number, it's real people feeling real effects of real conditions. That is reification, and it's something where the right wing just doesn't seem to have the ability. The result is that right wingers can care about, they can feel compassion and concern for, uh, people somehow close to them, people that they identify with directly, the me and mine idea. So when people from Delaware to New Jersey to New York to Connecticut were ravaged by Hurricane Sandy, to them, they didn't connect to that. The, the, the figures, the casualty figures, the property damage, it's just numbers. But what happens in Oklahoma, for people like Coburn and Inhofe, it's, wait a minute, no, that's my state. That's my people. I know these places. I've been to these places. I may have met some of these people. They have a connection to it in a direct way, and that they can relate to. But, well, they can relate to it in a way that people in communities further away, they just will not relate to. They're just not capable of it. Personally, I think that explains a lot of things about the differences in the way the left and the right approach things. And if you want to conclude from that, that I think that people on the left are more psychologically evolved than people on the right, you go right ahead. Well, I move on to something else. The other thing I wanted to talk about with regard to the Oklahoma tornado, because of course it came up, it's always going to come up, global warming. Is there any connection to global warming? Now, the fact is, the evidence that global warming is not only real, uh, but is affecting us already now, continues to grow. Uh, for example, according to a study by the United Kingdom's National Weather Service, it was, this was published in March, human-driven global climate change was one of the causes of the drought in East Africa in 2011, which means human-driven climate uh, change was one of the causes of a famine that killed tens of thousands of people. Here's another. One prediction of the impacts of global climate change is um, the spread of disease. And we may actually already be seeing that here in the United States. There's been an 850% increase in the incidence of a condition known as valley fever. Uh, it's uh, California and Arizona have been the worst hit. Now, valley fever is a painful, debilitating, and sometimes fatal disease contracted by breathing in fungus-laden spores carried by dust that's been disturbed by wind or some other activity. 
So you've got a warming, drier climate, which produces more dust, more easily disturbed, carrying spores that are in fact environmentally sensitive, and presto, you have a spreading disease. All right, so anyway, back to Oklahoma and the tornado. Did global warming cause this tornado? It, no one knows. There's no way to say. It's not scientifically possible to ascribe any particular weather event to global warming. You can't say that if global warming had never occurred that such and such a storm would not have happened. You just can't. There's no way to do it. What you can talk about is likelihoods. Climatologists are already predicting more severe weather as a result of climate change. One, result, one, one example rather that is hurricanes. The prediction is for fewer but more destructive storms over time. A similar prediction holds for blizzards that they'll be more severe, and that already seems to be happening. Tornadoes, however, are a different animal. There's a lot about tornadoes that meteorologists and climatologists still do not understand. What is understood is that there are two things you have to have in order for a tornado to form. One is um, the uh, energy-driven heat-humidity combination. Now, that's going to increase with global warming. But the other is wind shear. That's what actually generates the twisting wind currents that are actually what a tornado is. Some researchers believe that in a warming world, wind shear will be harder to come by. So it's possible that under global warming, you'd be less likely to have tornadoes because it'd be harder for them to form. On the other hand, it could also mean that those that do form would be the most destructive sorts. But as one researcher noted, if one factor for tornadoes you know is going up and the other's a wild card, it's still reasonable to say that it's more likely than not that global warming will produce more tornadoes. But the fact is, right now we really don't know. So should we expect more hurricanes as a result of global warming? Yes. Should we expect more blizzards? Yes. Should we expect more droughts? Yes. Should we expect this, expect this spread of diseases? Yes. Should we expect more tornadoes? We don't know yet. Let's take a break. We're back. We're back. I'm going to start here now with a couple of updates about something I talked about last week. Uh, last week I talked about uh, two things. The phantom scandal of the IRS supposedly targeting teabagger groups and the real scandal of the White House going after the phone calls of potentially scores of AP reporters. So I got some updates on both of those. Uh, on the IRS front, uh, contrary to previous reporting, in fact contrary to what I said last week, it turns out that there was one group that had its tax exempt status revoked during this time of closer examination of groups looking for tax exempt status. It was a liberal group called Emerge America, which works with state affiliates in order to train women to run as Democratic Party candidates. Meanwhile, on the real scandal front, uh, it's another case of, wait, it can get worse. The Washington Post has published a story about the Justice Department's monitoring of a Fox News reporter named James Rosen. This is yet another whistleblower case. This one of Stephen Jinwo Kim, a State Department contractor who was charged with espionage uh, for supposedly leaking some information about North Korea's nuclear program to Rosen. The DOJ tracked Rosen's comings and goings from the State Department. They timed the, uh, 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 traced rather the timing of his calls with a State Department security advisor. They got a search warrant to read his personal emails, which the State Department justified to the judge by calling Rosen a co-conspirator with Kim because he made an arrange with Kim about how to get the information to Rosen and also obtained the phone records for at least five different phone numbers used by Fox News. This is all part of President Hopi Changi's obsession with government secrecy, and the truth is this is getting scary. The, uh, the only upside of this is that previous presidents have found themselves getting into trouble when they actually went after the media. Let's hope the same is true here. Oh, and by the way, the amazing Mr. O has frequently praised the idea of whistleblowing. 
He even signed the Whistleblower Protection Act. But when the Huffington Post asked several nonprofit groups and the White House to name one whistleblower, one actual person that Obama has praised, they got zilch. Um, all right, last thing for today. Uh, there's a hard truth of which you may well be aware. Uh, poverty is going up. It's rising. 13% in 2008, 14% in 2009, 15% in 2010, over 16%, including nearly 20% of children in 2012. And poverty ultimately seems intractable. We seem incapable of getting it below 11%. Well, here's an idea to deal with that whose time has come again. MSNBC host Chris Hayes responded to a question from fellow host Melissa Harris-Perry about how we can deal with uh, fighting poverty with a sign that said, just give people money. It actually is that simple. And yes, it actually is. The idea goes by various names, guaranteed minimum in income, guaranteed annual income, universal basic income, but the guaranteed income part is the constant. The problem is that, if, if the problem is that people don't have enough money, give them enough money so that they're not living in poverty. Now, the idea that at first blush this idea seems impossibly radical and kind of weird, Really, it's just a reflection of how far our political debate has fallen in recent decades. This is not a new idea. In fact, it was widely discussed in the 1960s. In fact, although this is almost never remembered now, in 1970, Richard Nixon proposed a type of guaranteed income for families with children. It's a program he called the Family Assistance Program. And in fact, he got it passed through the House of Representatives. Now, the plan died in the Senate when Nixon, attempting to placate the right, kept proposing stricter and stricter work requirements as part of the program, which kept costing him more and more support among liberals. Does that sound familiar? But even after that failure, the idea did not fade away immediately. In 1972, George McGovern proposed giving a grant of cash to each individual. Now, unfortunately for him, he presented it as a concept rather than a specific program, and he was never able to put an actual budget figure to it, uh, as a result of which the idea got mercilessly mocked. And so here we are, 40 years later, coming back to the same ideas. If poverty is the problem, money is the answer. Now, it's not the complete answer. Okay, not the complete answer. I mean, what it does is it enable, enables people to go into the marketplace to buy the things they need, to not go cold, to not go cold or hungry. It's building that floor under everyone's needs that I talk about as being part of my basic political philosophy. But it's not a complete answer because there are things that are, or at least should be, uh, part of what I call the commons that area of joint right and mutual obligation that should, by all that is just and right, lie outside the market. Areas like basic human needs, like food, like health care, as well as areas for what you might call psychic needs, things like open space and uh, um, uh, the arts. Now, guaranteed income, while well, a certain amount of money can improve access to, to things such as these, it should not be required for it. That is, there should not be a certain minimum amount of money you have to have in order to have access to adequate nutrition, to adequate health care, in order to have access to open spaces or the arts. All right, now I'm going to cut myself off there on that. I'll get back to that someday. But uh, I'm going to get back to the basic idea. Can a guaranteed income work? Can ending poverty really be as simple as giving people money? Yes, it can. Yes, it is. The arguments against this are of two types. One is financial, the other, well, I'll get to that. The financial arguments are, where will the money come from and we can't afford it? Well, as for where the money can come from, there are two sources. One, we can just print it. We can just print it. Now, that could lead to inflation, of course, but um, that's not a problem we have now. The other place where some of the money can and should come from is the rich, whose share of our national income has been rising pretty much consistently over the past 40-plus years. 
Our work, our productivity increases over the past decades have been going mostly to making them richer, and it's about time we took some of that back. As for it will cost too much, those making the claim generally tend to just take the number of people, multiply it by the size of the grant, and give you a figure, which is a really dumb way to do it. One, because it doesn't account for the fact of outlays that will not happen because they're being replaced by this, uh, by this grant. And it also doesn't allow for the fact that if you give money to everybody, everybody's income increases, so a lot of people's federal tax bill is going to increase, and a significant part of what you put out is going to come back in again. But here's the bottom line. Is there a cost to this? Is there a net increase in federal spending? Maybe. I don't care. A program that would end poverty, that would increase bargaining power for workers, that would put an end to state officials determining whether some single mother deserves help or not, uh, that would put an end to the drug tests and all the other invasive, humiliating requirements, uh, a program that inherently recognizes the value of cooperative non-labor activities is surely one that has a price tag worth paying. But that brings us to the other objection. This one comes exclusively from the right. It's the harder one to overcome because it's not built either on economic logic or even self-interest, something which has actually led some people on the right to endorse a uh, guaranteed national income with the idea it would lead to a smaller government. No, this objection is cultural. It's psychological. It's mental. The objection is classism, contempt for the poor. It's the notion that if you provide people with the means to live above the poverty line, to just not be hungry or cold, to have their children not be hungry or cold, that they'll just lie back and live off other people's work. You'll find it in that long, stale bumper sticker that says, work hard or people on welfare are depending on you. You'll find it in the statement from my ex-mother-in-law who said, people on welfare are laughing at us. Um, it's the idea that they are not like us, that they just don't want to work, that they are lazy and indolent. But we know if we were in that position, oh, we'd be completely different. We wouldn't just sit there. Oh, no, we'd work hard. We'd look to protect our, to improve ourselves, to increase ourselves. We're not like them. It's a bigotry that's often founded in racism, but goes beyond it. Now, I have to admit, I don't know how to overcome this, especially given the right wing's failure at reification at being able to make an emotional connection to those not part of their direct circle. I guess, in fact, what we have to do is have to just keep on keeping on because I don't know what else to do. We're going to close out with our weekly reminder for you. As of May 21st, there have been at least 4,298 people killed by gunfire in the United States since Newtown, 36 of them in Massachusetts. You have the best week you possibly can. We will be back next week.